through it, I go, uh, we moved in there, uh, let's see, 1954, 53, and I was the youngest of six children with mom and dad, and mom, uh, had put, she told me that she had put in an application and had been waiting five years to get into the, uh, Pruitt Projects, which is, uh, you know, we lived, I guess you had to be below poverty level, I guess that's where we were, and so we moved in there, and, um, we moved to the ninth floor, that was the last floor, I mean the 11th floor, <clears throat> that was the last floor in the building, and we had a four-room apartment, and, um, so that made eight of us, there was two in each room, and I wanted to say there were bedrooms, but they weren't as big as bedrooms, all you could get in there was a bed, okay, and so we lived there, uh, if I was three, my the oldest siblings were somewhere around oh, 11 and 12, uh, I was four brothers, and there was two girls, two girls and four boys, and so... Uh, my brother said, one of my oldest brothers before he passed, he told me that they were, since they were the new kids on the block, they had fights all the time with the other people in the building, uh, the guys in the building. Because in our building, I don't know, it had to be at least a, maybe a thousand people in that one building. We lived 2311 Diddle, which is maybe about a block or so from Jefferson. And, uh, it was nice, like, yeah, from, um, from what I've been told that before uh, they let black people live in there, they had uh, uh, white youngsters, uh, young, coming into uh, the city, living in the city, and they lived there. And uh, uh, they had a small parking lot, but I'm thinking, and they had uh, security at the, uh, at the ground level where they had mailboxes in the office and things like that and security at the door and I'm thinking that if four bedroom might have been had one or two people in it when they were living there but a four bedroom when we got there you have ten people in there or more in one room so I didn't know about that but it was overcrowded but from what I can remember as being a young child is that it wasn't so bad because I you know I I don't have too much memory, but I do know that we went to private school, we went to St. Nicholas, we were fortunate, but back in the day, they didn't have kindergarten in uh, private school, so we went to Pruitt School in kindergarten, and then we walked to St. Nicholas uh, every morning from 2311 Biddle to 18th and Lucas, so it was about 14, 15 blocks, I don't know, one way. And uh, good education is different from public school. Um, we wore uniforms and we had small classrooms. Uh, let's see, when I was in school, the eighth grade had 10 kids in it and the seventh grade had 12, and so they put the two rooms together. And when I was going there, they may have had in the whole school 80 or 90 kids. Well, say it wasn't so bad. Then I did go to kindergarten in the Pruitt, and then after that, six years old, three years later, we, mom put in, before that mom had put in an application to move into the Vaughn Projects, which is on 18th Street and eight, um, 18th and Biddle. So uh, after we lived in the Pruitt for a while. We had to experience, I'll get back to that, uh, elevators not working to get you to the 11th floor. Maybe some washing machines, they had, uh, and dryers. Uh, they had two floors of washing machines and dryers, but it wasn't enough for everybody in the building, so they kind of broke down every now and then. And then we had problems with the uh, heat and roaches and uh, bed books. And they would, uh, say they would come in and spray every now and then.
now and then, but some people are not as clean as others and didn't know how to keep the farmers out. They're just constantly having bed bugs and constantly having roaches. And I can remember one day, uh, I don't know, I must have been six or seven, and my sister must have been eight, nine or ten, and she tried to get a bed bug that was crawling up the wall, and she stood on a little nightstand that was glass and fell through it and uh, cut her legs up and everything. And, of course, Mom and Dad were mad, you know, and upset about that, about the baby. Well, she wasn't there, but, you know, uh, that was pretty significant. So, you know, they reported it, but what we did every day before we went to bed, bed was go through the mattress, turn it upside down or whatever, and get, the, get those dead bugs out because, you know, they bite on you, and you have sores on your legs, ankles, arms, and everywhere. And that was pretty bad. And I, uh, the roaches, we kind of kept that bay because we would come in and start killing roaches every day from when we were in the schools, on the wall, on the floor, uh, in the mob, just everywhere. So um, that was something we had to contend with. But... Uh, as far as education, we were fine. As far as then being uh, being acclimated to the community and uh, my brothers not getting beat up so much because they were new to the neighborhood, and so uh, Dad he went to to confront the boys that were beating up his sons, and so he was uh, went downstairs with him one day after work and uh, asked him who was beating them up, and then told him to line up. And then have my brothers, and they had to fight them. And they had to fight them until they beat them up. And so after days and days and days of getting beat up, then they were fine. And so that was a big impact right there, uh, which led my brothers into high school, where after that they didn't have too many problems because then everybody knew about the Lloyd boys. And so... And it had too many problems with folks uh, trying to uh, get them in the breezeway or in the stairways or whatever because uh, they had uh, street credit, okay? Then we moved down to the vines, and let's see if I was 10, I had to be 1960, 61 or something like that, and... Um, by then, my brothers had graduated to high school, and we moved down there to, to a four-bedroom apartment. There were nine floors, but we had we were on the second floor, so that was good. But uh, I see when Mom got that that first application in through it, I forgot to put this in. She uh, said that she felt like she was like the Jeffersons. Uh, she's moving on up to the big time because, see, where we were living, you didn't, it was a walkthrough. You didn't have uh, indoor plumbing. You didn't have a uh, stove. You didn't have a refrigerator. You didn't have electricity. And so she was very happy about that. But then we had all those bugs and all those, uh, we call them chinches back then. They call them bed bugs now. And then grandma and grandpa used to come down to the house after church. They couldn't get upstairs. They couldn't walk up nine flights. So when we went down to the vine, that was uh, better. And then the, the guys were, my brothers were teenagers then. I was 10. My sister was almost 13 and graduating from grade school. And uh, so back then, and my, uh, they had what they call recreation centers we moved to an area where the uh, area was self-sufficient we had a uh, little you know mom and pop's grocery stores and we had little churches uh, in the neighborhood and we had uh restaurants we had um skating rinks movie theaters barber shops uh cleaners is there anything that you need you know, a community could have for self-sustaining. And then on the weekends, we used to have uh, trucks, vegetable trucks come in. They would be selling, uh, they might have a, a truckload uh, 
in the back of the truck and I have apples or oranges or peaches or watermelons, corn, potatoes and stuff like that. They would come by and you can get maybe a whole, what we call a shopping bag now for maybe about 50 cents of this stuff. You might be able to get a watermelon for about 50 cents of corn on the cob, you know, if you had it. But uh, back in the day, you know, uh, we had mom and dad. Dad worked. I don't know. Back then, maybe uh, the pay was like two dollars an hour. I don't know how how much you get. You know, was minimum wage. You know what I'm saying? So stuff was uh, not easy to come by, even though it was cheap to get. You know, uh, on the weekends. But uh, we grew up as a Christian family, so you know we ate breakfast together. A certain time we prayed. We, we ate dinner together, and we always prayed, but, you know, sometimes we had to wait for dinner because we didn't know, uh, you know, what we were going to have, you know, poor people, they have to buy food every day, you, you know, buy it once a month or when you get paid, you, just, you, have to go to, you don't know what you're going to have that day, you know, you know how much money you're going to have, you know, you, you know, six kids, everybody got to have uniforms, everybody got to eat, dinner, eat lunch at school, which you have to pay for and stuff like that. I say, Dad had one paycheck. So then I say, my brothers, you know, they used to hustle, you know, sell newspapers, sign shoes, or whatever. And Mom didn't work because Dad didn't want her to work because he was just very jealous. He, he thought she was so pretty and everybody wanted, to, wanted her. So he's like, you stay at home and you be the housewife. So things were not, you know, it, it, it was tough. So one day, Grandma bought Mama a sewing machine. And so then... That helped with the clothes. Mama learned how to sew uniforms. She learned how to sew suits for my brother. She sewed everything except for underwear. She could sew bedspreads, pillowcases, curtains. She sewed communion dresses, prom dresses. She sewed, oh, uh, she bought patterns. And, oh, we had to stand up, you know, and she pinned the stuff on us, the girls and the boys. Okay, so... That helped us a bit. People thought we were rich. We was poor as hell, just like everybody else. But you know what? She learned how to improvise. I said, her mama was, her mama picked cotton. And she she uh, she was uh, domestic. After that, we moved. Uh, we got this close to Missouri. I think she was here from Virginia, Grandma. And then um, Grandpa, one of my grandpas was a chauffeur. Another, and then uh, Grandma was. Uh, she worked in the kitchen, or, or she worked in the laundry, you know, so stuff just passed on as far as how to keep us uh, clothes, you know, if we could buy materials and stuff like that and stuff. So uh, I say when Dad and Mom, they was, Dad was in the service. He got drafted. We had, he had three kids. He was working as first black comptroller. A deed of something at City Hall. It was in the newspaper. Now, say, I got some newspaper articles for you where he was first black now. I think he was about 26 years old then. And they drafted him. And um, he comes back, but you know, the point I'm trying to make is that I don't know where we had to be so clean. And then, you know, we had to, when you walk out the house, you couldn't have rollers in your hair and a, you couldn't have a shower cap and. And back then, we used to have thongs and beach shoes for in the shower. You can't, mm -mm. Dad said, you can't go out like that. You can't go outside and play like that. You go outside and play. We had to iron. You had to iron your shorts. And you had to iron your little tops. And, my brother, we had, and so we hair, my brother, my mama learned how to fix hair. She bought uh, clippers so she can cut hair. So my brother's hair was cut. And then my sister and I, we, uh, she did our hair. Anything that you had to get done, he did. So, uh, and like I say back then, I didn't know I was poor. Hell. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't know, you know. And then back then, parents, they kept a lot from you. You know, it's, it's enough growing up like that and, and it being black so they didn't, you know, don't worry about the bills and don't worry about this. And, you know, there was no cussing in the house. And, no, and everything was a secret. How you going to, you know, grown up didn't let children in on conversation you had to leave the room or leave the house so I, like i say we i didn't know how it was you know uh, back then but 
it was fine for me growing up, you know. So then, um, I say uh, back in the community, we did have uh, some like a sustaining community. But then uh, you always had to, uh, downtown where you had uh, dealer, not dealer, sticks and famous, and all the stores down there. Uh, by then we were lived on 18th and Biddle, and the stores were like they started like on Sixth Street and Franklin, and they went all the way back to Washington, going uh, south. So uh, now we did have to go down there sometimes to uh, buy groceries or to uh, buy just maybe some stockings or something. I don't know, but we had back then they had street cars. And so if you would go to the store with Mama and we had to go downtown to get something because, see, back then you didn't, but they had banks when Daddy got paid. I think he just went to the pharmacy or something to cash a check or something. And then to pay bills, we went to the pharmacy to get money orders like that. So back then, if you wanted, Mama had to get something from downtown, you had so much money. So you either walk, uh... I don't know, 20 blocks to get to where it was. And then uh, back then, I think it cost like 10 cents or 15 cents to ride the street car. So she's like, maybe we had, we can walk one way, you coming or going. But we had, uh, and then you ride back one way. So we would have to, me and my sister ride, uh, or my brother would go to the store with her and um, ride walk or if we decide that we want to get some caramel popcorn and peanuts and jelly beans then we would get that and walk back both ways with the bags and stuff i was telling you back then everybody walked everywhere even to school to high school 30 blocks one way or whatever you know you just walked it was just a thing to do so uh then we would go downtown to get groceries, but most of the time we just they would, we would window shop. And I know what Mama was saying. She would go and look in the windows to see what the latest fashions were so she get materials. She can sew stuff for my, herself and my brothers and sisters. And then back then, you can go in the all stores and like, whites only. Uh, colors can't go past the, uh, what do you call it, the restaurant stand, which was right there in the, at the Five and Dime or Chrissy's, you can go right there and you can go inside the stores and stuff like that. And I thought that was kind of, that was kind of messed up back then, you know, because I think back then we were called colored. Now we call it something else now. So anyway, we did that. And then, uh, like I told you before, uh, since my brothers were teenagers back then, and, you know, they, uh, were harassed by the police quite a bit, you know, and they were taken downtown for laudering, uh, taken to jail for laudering, uh, cause they was, they'd be outside the building after hours, I don't know what, after hours, 10, 11 o'clock, you know, just gather maybe about seven, eight of them with their friends, you know, and then they say, you know, they pick them up and take them to jail and they call them, mom, I need in jail. Mama would be crying because, you know, back then they would you go to jail. They'd beat you up with those telephone books and those billy clubs. So she didn't know how her children were going to come back uh, home. And she had to get money to get them out of jail. And back then, I don't know, you spend 24 hours in there, but I think you might have to pay 20 or $24 or something. That's, that's like a week's pay. Hell, I don't know how they would get them out so often, you know, but they would try to. I think one time they didn't get them out, and that's how they found out they was getting beat up. So, uh, she told them to be careful, because, see, uh, we can't keep doing this. They will start running. That's why I told you a lot of people know how to, uh, good runners in the projects, because we had either run from the enemies or run from the police who were policing us, who were white. Okay, and they come to the neighborhood, they didn't know us, but, you know, sometimes they say they will be bored. For example, one day uh, I come from skating, St. Nicholas Skating Rink, as a matter of fact. And then, by then, I think I was about 17 or 18, and my brother had a car. He had a, back then they called it a deuce and a quarter, because he was, I think he might have been working at the car plant. And he came and got my, uh, me and my girlfriend from 
skating, and I lived in the Pruitt, and she lived in the Igo. And then the police stopped us on 20th Street, right past Delmore, and because uh, my brother and a brother-in-law were sitting in the front. They had the little hats on, and, uh, some felt hats, what they call it. I forget what kind of hats uh, what they called them. But back then, they wore hats. And the police stopped us, and uh, my brother said, well, what? I, if I was 17, then this brother had to be, uh, I don't know, 23 or 24. And he asked, well, why are you stopping us? He said, because we were bored. And he said, y'all look like pimps, and these are your whores in the back. He's like, what the hell? We just come from skiing. <laughs> but he, you know, profiled us. And, you know, I say they, they didn't have anything else to do. And they detained us about five or ten minutes, and then they let us go. And that was my first encounter of being profiled. I guess my brother, they get it all the time. But I was scared to death. I'm like, what is going on? What is happening? He wasn't speeding, just taking us home, you know, and, and then skating let out about 10. So it had to be 10, 15 or 10, 30 on the weekend on like a Friday. And so, uh, like I say that was my first experience of being uh, profiled with my brother because the police were tired. I mean, they were just bored. And so here we come down the street with this, long deuce in the quarter shining and the youngsters in it and so we had to be into something crazy so that passed i'm like okay so now uh we have i'm missing something well you talked about your brother sometimes standing outside of the uh, building singing and sometimes they'd get arrested for that yeah I say, Mama, Mama, these police down there bothering them. Because, you know, they would be down there, they are talking, or they might be singing, you know, the classes, like I say, Smokey Robinson or Marvin Gaye, all of the little group songs where, you know, harmonizing stuff, whatever. But sometimes uh, when they be, they're below, they're at the building, but, you know, uh, Somebody lives upstairs, you know, on the second floor, the third floor, whatever, you know, but they would be singing and then the cops would come in and get them. And, not, you know, uh, and they live right up, they lived in the building. Why don't you just tell them to go go to bed? But no, they would take them downtown to, uh, uh, on 12th Street, we call it, uh, on Tucker, 12th and Tucker is where the police station was then. Yeah, so, um. And then they were teenagers then. I was going to say they were still in high school. Yep. What else did I miss? But I'm thinking, then, you know, projects may uh, shape me to who I am because then I was still in the Vaughn. And then when I graduated from grade school, I went to Catholic high school. Okay. And then... Uh, let's see, I got a double, I think, when I was uh, in high school. I had, uh, when I graduated from grade school, I had a perfect score on my Iowa test. It was 12.9. You're supposed to get 8.9 because that's 8th grade, ninth month, and that's where you're supposed to test out. But I tested so well, so I went to the Catholic school instead of the public school, which was the Shine. And uh, the Catholic school I went to was St. Mark's, where uh, it, it was down the street from my grandparents' house. And my auntie was the first black student to go there. And then I had a cousin that went there and uh, some of the girls in the neighborhood. And I'm like, well, you know what? I was a brownie up here in that little church, and I think I might want to go to this school. So I ride the bus to uh to as far as it would go uh, from the projects to, to I think it was Albert or Euclid or something then I would walk to St. Mark's Academy and because I knew you know uh it was a mixed school but I didn't know it was so terrible but anyway long story short was uh 
I wasn't in a class. It was class with the black girls who were at the in the basement of the school. It was two classes of black students because it was all girls school, and I think they had something like I don't know, forty or fifty in each class, and then I was two stories up with the white students, and it was like thirty of us in the class, but it was like five blacks in my class, and so and then all the rest was white, but. It was uh, challenging because instead of, you know, I'm going to school, instead of having algebra, I'm having geometry. Instead of having you know, English, I'm having literature, you know, stuff like that, you know. So, um, but it was okay except for the math. But I didn't have too many friends because they were white and they didn't, I didn't care too much for me, I guess, because I was black. But anyway, uh, one day we were having a play, and they were uh, we were rehearsing for it, and then, you know they had the freshmen doing the backdrops and stuff. And then this senior, this white girl, saw me. She asked me why did I want to come to that school? Where was I at that school? And I'm like, that's so awful. And here I'm what 13 years old, like, cause I wanted to come here. I didn't know what to say. All I knew was to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. We all, you know, we didn't talk. We didn't cuss and all that. I didn't know how to come back. And then clap back at her. And then, uh, like I said, on my way home that day, that particular day, like I said, I used to catch the bus, but I would walk three or four blocks to catch it. But this day, there was a bus right next to the school by state. And I got on that bus, and those white girls laughed at me, and they pointed at me like a poor black girl. And I just felt so dejected. I'm like, first of all, you don't have sports for me, then I don't have any friends, and then y'all laugh at me, and then I had to go to church every, we went to church every day, but the nuns got on me because I'm going to church, but I wasn't going to communion. And so I'm like, but I don't like that host. It makes me sick. It makes me nauseated. Well, you then you need to go to confession. And I went to confession. Then that still wasn't enough. Then I had to go get the host, get put in my mouth, and then walk down the aisle and then throw it away because it made me sick. I'm like, y'all don't like me. I don't like this place. I need to go back down to the neighborhood. When I get back home, I go to the recreation center. Recreation center had everything in it with my the parents all the way down to the children to go. My brothers went there for boxing and football and basketball and uh, baseball and whatever other sports they had because then they would compete with other community centers. And I would go in, we had tap dance and ballet dance and uh, square dance and we had sports, we had plays, we had all kinds of stuff. Then mom would come with us and they had stuff for them, flower arrangements, uh, uh, baking stuff in the kiln so you take home for pottery. Uh, and anything you do, you know, the whole community was involved in the community recreation centers. And they were throughout the area, uh, throughout the city of St. Louis. They had, uh, I don't know, maybe altogether maybe 10 or 15 recreation centers. And I know we had maybe about five on this side of Delmore, you know, the Delmore Divide. And they had others on the other side. I mean, we could compete. So the neighborhood was really, I guess, not released. Uh, you know, it was, you know, uh, the home away from home, home away from school, or, you know, the safe place, even though you had to be wary about where you live, uh, which building you live in, because, you know, sometimes, you know, I say you get run home, or you get, one of, who are you? Who are you looking at? You got to start running if you ain't with a group. But it was better than what I was getting at my my uh, Catholic school, my private school. But um, I don't know. I say it. It was for me. It was. I loved being down there. I loved the projects because like I said, I was on. I felt like the only child because I was the youngest and everybody else was older. So whenever they would go leave home and I wouldn't have anything to do and I couldn't get outside. So um, little stuff that, you know, around the area was good for me. And, you know, so I, I learned a lot of stuff, you know. So what we learned back then, you know, when it rained, you would go to the gutters and you would put little twigs 
where the water would go and then you would race the twigs with your friends. I learned to shoot marbles. I learned to shoot mama's heads. I learned it. This is all from my brothers. I learned they did, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, cork ball, uh, all of this. Because back then, projects, was, that vine was pretty nice. They had grass, and they watered the grass every day. They had all, uh, you know, just amenities that were, uh, weren't all messed up like the Pruitt was, you know, because the Pruitt was a little older, you know. So uh, there was always something to do until after, you know, until the sun went down. The sun went down, then the police come out, then, you know, you got to start moving around or, you know, you had to go somewhere where you don't have to be harassed. But uh, I say I had friends down there and I enjoyed it, but. I don't know what to find out is that in the project, and you know, if you live in the project, you, you are a proud person because it's where you come from, it ain't where you come from, it's where you're going. And if you can survive the project, you know, I used to tell people when I was, used to work, uh, don't mess with me because I'm from the project, and they didn't know what that meant, but it's like, uh, as much as I've been through, I ain't going through nothing with you. And so, you know, uh, anything you got for me, anything you got to say, anything you got to do, is nothing compared to what a person has to go through living in the projects. You know, so, but then, before we moved out of the project, uh, man, we moved out of the projects, it wasn't as bad, you know, they didn't have gangs and they didn't have drugs and the people weren't, they didn't have guns shooting one another and all of that, you know. So I said, you know, it was, it had its drawbacks, but for me, as a kid growing up, we had, I had a more good time than, you know, the drawbacks because I didn't know the problems that we were having, the things that you had to go through just to live, you know. Then, I went from the Catholic school to Vashon. And then this is where it just carried because, um, I never had gone to a public school before. And then when I quit going to the Catholic school, I didn't want to go to Vashon. I wanted to go to Sumner or Beaumont because, you know, I wanted to be a teacher. And I'm like, those have some, some been the good schools. But then they didn't let me in the district, so I had to go to Vashon. And I cried and cried. And so here I'm going to Vashon. Here I'm an excellent student. And then I get to Vashon. It was not what I thought it would be as far as the best teachers. They didn't have uh, enough books. They didn't have paper that the wall, I mean, it didn't, the school didn't, the classroom didn't look, uh, what I want to say, uh, welcoming, you know, and some of the teachers were not, they, uh, they didn't teach you stuff. They talked about you and ridiculed you in class. They don't want to come to class. Look at me, you're sleeping all day. It ain't gonna be nothing. I'm like, I really gotta hurry up and be a teacher because yeah, this ain't right. You can't treat the kids like this. You know, all my life I've been where with the nuns who are white, but they were strict, and you learn their stuff, you know. But mm, yeah, they didn't even care. So I was my first year there. I was not. Uh, I was just. I don't know what the best word for it was, conf I don't know why I can say confused, <laughs> okay? And so I went through that first year, I was a 10th grader, but they had me in some ninth grade classes, okay? And so I say none of the classes, uh, co only half of the classes I went to did, some, did the people really care actually about teaching. And then my first year there, I was assaulted. I was uh, sexually assaulted by a man teacher. And, oh, my God. Uh, this guy, he uh, saw me going to class. And that's another thing. When you have the class, and, you know, teachers encourage you to go to class and be on time. He's like, here, I write you a tardy slip. I'm like, a tardy slip? So he said, I want you to help me carry this to the equipment room. He had some uniforms, uh, basketball uniforms. I'm like, well, okay. And then I, took it, and I followed him to to the, uh, what I want to say, not the locker room, but, you know, 
something like that to put the uniform down. And then I'm like, turn around and say, I'm going to class. And then he kissed me in my mouth. And I ran and I ran and I ran. I had one no damn note. And I ran. I'm like, oh my God. And then, by then I had a little boyfriend. And his dad was a disciplinarian, my uh, teacher at the school. And before I got home, he had called my mama and told my mama what had happened. Because I didn't know what to say. I'm like, mama's going to get me. Because, you know, you ain't supposed to do you ain't supposed to have no problems. Don't have any problems. Back then, you didn't know that, you know, you're supposed to report it, but we didn't. And then she called the principal, and we went up there, and uh, he said he was sorry that he had a daughter my age. We had a meeting, and he'd never do that. I'm like, like, I'm lying. I don't even know you. So what? So the principal said, well, what do you want done, Sharon? I'm like, fire him. I can't fire him because he got family. He got to I'm like, what? I got to go to school with this every day. He wasn't even one of my teachers. Yeah. He just saw me in the hallway. That's how y'all do people around here. Mm -hmm. So they didn't fire him. And then the other teachers found out about it. His friends, because when I found out about it, there's a lot of pedophiles at that school. I uh, say, you know, I had good times at the school because they had a lot of sports and a lot of clubs, but. If you're a girl or a boy, you you got to watch out because uh, the men get the boys and the men get the girls too. Okay, so after that, um, see, I was a sophomore. I was in my chemistry class. And then here comes a teacher. Uh, this teacher's like, uh, here, take this note to uh, Mr. Taylor. He's uh, down the hallway. And then I'm like, doing class here. I, this is something I couldn't understand. <laughs> They were taking out of class for a note, and I took the note to the teacher, and the teacher opened up the note, and I read it with him, talking about this is the girl that uh that uh got the teacher in trouble, and then the teacher looked up at me and said, "Oh, so you Sharon Lord?" So then by then I knew I went home and told Mama. Then we had another meeting, and the principal called. Oh, it was four teachers come to my office right now, and then I don't know what he said to him, but then after that he like uh. Anybody else mess or harass her, y'all gonna be fired. And so then when the classes would change, they would come out the door and look at me. They wouldn't say anything to me. But I'm like, okay, that was done. But then they had another teacher. Well, I don't even want I I won't even go into that, but just several a couple of teachers that, you know, they wanna feel on you and whatever, they send you, get you a no, here, come out off and I got something for you, then I but I don't know you and then they say, No, you wanna be feeling on you physically and so uh it was either that or they would have uh teachers men teachers uh um uh, what i want to say uh talk to the girl t girl students and say meet me at the hotel on the weekend and that's how they would get their grades a teacher told me this she's like i know you're not like this little lord but these girls like i'm like why are you doing this it was, it was, that that part I didn't like. That part, no. So, I'm like, well, I'm not doing this one. So, you know, you ain't got to be telling me. And you tell me too much, I'm going to tell the principal. So then I was an advocate after that. So then, that happened. This is now in the 1968. Okay, this is right before the, uh, during the Vietnam War thing. And, um, we had, uh, uh, the Boys, um, uh, Athletic Association that used to have a queen contest every year. So we were having a queen contest. And then we had, uh, what's this guy? This activist Perry and Dick Gregory there had some people to come up to the school. There's about 10 guys in combat boots and military uniforms. And they uh, came through the school, running through the school with sticks, banging on walls and doors, because what we were having was a queen contest. And this girl back then, she had an afro, and they did the, the guys who were running the queen contest, the boys' athletic club, 
said that she could not run as a queen if she did not fix her hair. And then that's when we had Ophelia came and they uh, closed our school down. And um, I guess we made history because then after that, they're like, we're not going to have a queen contest. We're going to have to, uh, this year, we're going to have to make some some other rules, whatever, because why won't you let this girl run for queen? Because she's got an afro. That was the first person in school to ever wear an afro. And she wasn't wearing one at first, but she did after, you know, so much going on with the war and everything. So, you know, more and more people were getting them. And so uh, after they tore up the school, running down the hallway, scaring everybody, and parents would come to get their kids, they had to cut out uh, the queen contest because of discrimination. Okay, that was a good move because that crafted me when I did go to college. Then I helped form the Student Black Union. And then we did form one there at Rashawn, too, because to, uh, we had civil unrest everywhere. And now it's coming into the schools, you know. So then we got through that. And uh, I was disappointed because I thought I was going to win. You know, you go around, we were campaigning, and you had the little signs, and then I bought suckers and uh, straight pins, and then you put them on a little piece of paper, and they like, vote for Sharon or vote for me or whatever. We had been campaigning for a while, but it was about five girls. But after that, after they tore up that school, we were like, no, it's not safe, and because these boys won't let this girl <coughs> run for a queen, because of her hair, then, mm -mm. so that was, that was, that took me aback. I'm like, man, this, this is serious here. So see, then after that, I uh, went to high school, I mean college, and then I got my afro. And then we had to, it was, you know, demonstration after demonstration, you know, because like I say, I, they were taking kids out of high school, drafting them, and then, in the projects, and then they would come, uh, classmates of mine, they would come back dead in body bags. And so it was, you know, all the, in the 60s, the people, the, the entertainers and the musicians and the singers, they were making songs about the Vietnam War and bring the boys back alive and it ain't our war. Because y'all don't, y'all don't claim us as being people, but Y'all got the most of us over there, and then the most of us dying, and then we ain't even the most as far as where we stand in America. Y'all are 60, 70 percent, and we just 30 percent, but we got 90 percent of us in the, in the war. And then we, mm, so it was a difficult, it was a, it was a difficult time as far as civil unrest, uh, black America, or colored America against white America then. So we ran through all things of our society as far as in the projects of how we lived. We couldn't get jobs if our hair wasn't a certain way or if we didn't dress a certain way or if we didn't talk a certain way or whatever. You just, and then back then, it, you didn't get jobs if they knew the address or the zip code. They used to say that um, there was a thing saying that if they had your social security number, those people had even numbers in the middle then they knew that you were black and so that they wouldn't hire you. Or back then they had um, black entertainers selling records, but they couldn't put their name on the cover of the record because, see, then the white folks wouldn't buy, so they just put a big flower on the cover of the record so they, you know, the white folks were bad, so they wouldn't say uh, to each other, you buying that color people's record or whatever. I don't know what it was, but... That was discerning to me. I'm like, why? Do, what did we do in America to these people so they don't like us like this? Or we built America. Why don't they like us? Uh, what did we do to deserve all of this? And we don't have any control. We don't have control of money. We don't have control of weaponry. So, so why are they afraid of us? And why do they treat us so bad? 
but it's life for some people. You know, if you're not black, you don't can't really understand it. Where you have to be black all the time. The white white people are like uh, they don't really understand it, but you have to live it to know it. And so, like I say, if you come from a project and you survive, it's not where you come from or where you're going. Then that you have a uh, Ah, uh, you have, I don't know, you crossed a big mountain in life, and you are a qualified human now, so you have been through hell and survived, so you could sit down and tell the world how to do it, so, let's see, what else, and I missed something, you got a question for me? Um, yeah, you had talked about your brothers um, being called up in the draft. And, Say what? Uh, you had talked about your brother uh, who was caught oh. up in the draft oh, and, yeah. and your mom uh, taking action about that? Yeah, we had, uh, so back in uh, the 50s or the 60s, you know, they didn't have jobs back then. And then they called it the Cold War. And a couple of my brothers, they went to uh, the service. But then the Vietnam War comes, and then the, the one brother that had not gone to service uh, because see, after you graduate from high school, there's no job. So when he graduated from high school, he had found a job, and so he didn't. He had uh, to register to vote. I mean, register for the draft. And so um, they called him. I think he had to be by then. He had to be about twenty five, twenty six, and. Uh, they, they drafted him to go to Vietnam, and oh, Lordy. I think the whole family almost died there because that's the first person that we had to have in my personal family to be drafted to go to the, to the war. And um, we've had bad experiences. Folks, we went. They came back with uh, some attendance gone or didn't, they didn't come back. And then, you know, that a big thing with Ali. Man, he wasn't going, and then they stripped him of everything because he's like, this ain't my war. And so um, he went to jail, and when I found out some people, some guys, they just left the, the state. That was my brother's age. But my brother, uh, the one that was drafted, uh, we tried to fight it, since him going to Vietnam. But by then, I say, uh, um, my uh, uncle was in the politics, and that's, you know, my brothers, they had started back in the um, late 60s an organization called the First Congressional District Young Voters. All of them had Afros. I think Lois was one of them. I think it started out with just seven people, and it grew to like um, 25 or 35 people. Okay, so uh, he was one of them uh, that... Uh, any civil unrest, they, they were there in the city of St. Louis, whether it's White Castle or whether it's Jefferson Bank or whether it's one of the Alderman's meetings or whether it's uh, the Post-Dispatch of the Globe. Okay, so he was one of those uh, in my in the organization. And so when, when that one brother got the, the call for Vietnam, well, we weren't going. Mama was like, well, you're not going. Uh, you have to, we were going to send them out of state, too. And so uh, uh, she had a, a sister to live out of state, so her older sister, so that's where we are going to send them. But uh, she called the justice sister, and she called the woman, and then she called my uncle. She said, well, uh, he can find somewhere for him that he had to work on it. And we kept him out of that service. And then they said, you know, uh, they put him in Alaska. He went to Alaska, I think it was for two years. I don't think it was before you get drafted. I think it's two years then. I think it was. And uh, I went right to him and talk with him. He's like six months of dark and six months of light. And I say, well, you ain't going to complain about that because you're still living. And so... Uh, he worked himself through that. I think he may have been one of the people, too, that was in on the, uh, um, 
did lawsuit for uh, down in the projects where they had uh, what I want to say lung disease and uh, the other thing that they were working on down there that we had uh, a best I don't know what it was but he was one of the litigants with my other brother as to sue uh, I guess the city because we had people guys were coming out giving in, getting interviews from them so anyway. Yeah, he went to Alaska, and he survived. And he got, he came back home. We were so happy to see him, because Robert, people were dying. We were dying in Vietnam. We weren't even classified as citizens. Hell, we couldn't even vote. Hell, and we, <laughs> they drafted us to go to the service, and we weren't even qualified citizens. Uh, they didn't see us as citizens. So, yes, my brother came back home. We were happy that he came back home. And, and you know what? The only thing wrong with the service, you whether you get drafted or whether you get, you just walk in off the street. If you have a job, when you come back, you don't have a job. And then, like, my daddy went to that war. They they don't come back home and give them medical service. Uh, uh, well, you know, they need, just like the people go, this is what I think, the people go up to, uh, in space, you got to come back home. You got to do three, four months, in, you know, uh, to demilitarize or de something, debunk you from Earth to to the moon. But this is what they need to do for these boys who bombs bursting in air. People, you you are shooting the gun at your rifle, and then you turn around and you see body parts and legs and arms everywhere and shit. They need to let them boys come back home, take care of them, and then. Get them their job back, just like they did when they had what World War One and World War Two, and all the men went, and then the women had to take over the men's job. But when the men came back, the women had to give up the men's job. You know, because you know they didn't have rights either. You know, they working in plants and they making bullets and they making this and that and airplane stuff, whatever the men were doing. But they come back home, they took over the women's jobs. But the point I'm trying to make is, these boys are damaging. Uh, when they come back from the service, and then they ain't got no jobs, they ain't got no medical, they ain't got no place where they can go for six months or a year to get all that out of their minds, and then they put them on the street, and then that's it. So I think they need to clean that that part up. But you know, the people who have the power, well, they ain't going there. They ain't going, so they ain't got nothing to clean up. So you know, they not even think about that part. I guess, and I know it's been brought up, but anyway, my brother came home, and uh, he wasn't crazy, but you know, <laughs> it wasn't uh, in in the war where he had to be blasted like my dad was, came back crazy, I would think, <clears throat> but my dad died when I was 13, so I didn't really know him too well, but I do know he didn't have a job when he came back home. And he had to be a bodyguard at uh, at a tavern. It was no job. And he was uh, uh, working at City Hall. I'm like, what? what the hell? You can't get your job back. He had to walk around and find another job. And he didn't give you no kind of medical. I mean, mm. So that was that was challenging right there. That was, that was different. I like to say, my brother came home. So, you know, and in one piece. So, we were blessed. We prayed on that, and we thank God for that one. For sure. What did your father die of? Uh, cancer. He had, um, I think it was uh, nasal. It was up in his face. No. Uh-huh, and, uh, see, like back then, then, you know, they didn't have, they had chemo and all that, but it was for people who had medical and had money or whatever, but black folks got cancer, we just, they just gave him pain pills and he just did it at home. So he, uh, he had that his face was eaten out on one side. It was like, you come home, you smell death every day. The house was just smelling every for months because he could take his tongue and lick it out, uh, stick it out inside his face. He had no face on it. After it the, the cancer just eaten from his nose all the way back to his ear. And 
And then mom had to, mom got a job after that. She had to come home and change his bandages. It was awful. Yeah, so yeah, he had, uh, he died at 39. So, see, they had gotten married. He was only with her for 20 years, I guess. They were in their 20, 20, 21 when they got married and started having kids after that. So yeah, he, he died of cancer. Um, what is something that people believe about Pruitt Igo that you'd like to correct them or or give a different point of view? Oh, well, let's see. I would say the project is a, a good place, is a starting point for youngsters, for young people coming up. But uh, what they should know is that it's not a place where. Um, it's a stepping stone is what I want to say and so uh, you work hard to get out of there and uh, you can be very successful but you know sometimes they can't get out of there because of what society won't let them out for any reason they can't get a good job or they can't get resources get good education but as far as a community back then it was a community just like any other neighborhood, we just didn't have a name of like Bevo Mill area and stuff like that, but it was a community. They just called it Project. And so as far as uh, coming up back in those days, I would say that would be the best place to start your family. It would be in the projects. Because mm -hmm. like I said, they had all the amenities. You didn't even have to leave. I mean, you know, you had you know, places for the kids to play place where you can um, do laundry or whatever, or a place where you can do neighborhood shopping. So, you know, uh, that part, I mean, it, it, uh, I say it's a great place to start. Great place to start. Now, what they could have done was tighten up on the uh, educational part around, you know, the facilities around the projects. Uh, for the kids, you know, but as far as growing up, uh, and always having something to do, and uh, the neighbors know you, and they tell on your parents, tell your parents that something's happening with you, that the parents weren't around, it was close knit. Uh, that was that was a wonderful, that was wonderful as far as 